Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program, we have a report on how American businesses are using artificial intelligence tools more and more. Later, Faith Perlo and Dan Novak present a new everyday grammar report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, more American businesses are starting to use. Artificial intelligence or AI tools to come up with new ideas and to deal with customers. Mattel is known for making children's toys. The company recently used an AI image generator called Dolly to come up with ideas for new Hot Wheels toy cars. The used vehicle seller Carmax is using ChatGPT to gather thousands of customer comments. The social media service Snapchat has added a chatbot to its messaging service, and Instacart, a delivery service, now uses ChatGPT to answer food questions. Even the Coca-Cola company plans to use AI. To help create new marketing content, it has not said exactly how it plans to use the technology, but the move shows that businesses are under pressure to use the tools that many of their employees and customers are already trying on their own. We must embrace the risks, Coca-Cola CEO James Quincy said. In a video announcing a partnership with OpenAI, maker of both Dolly and ChatGPT, some experts warn that businesses should carefully consider possible harms to customers, society, and their own companies before choosing to use AI tools in the workplace. Claire Lebowitz is with the Partnership on AI. A nonprofit group, the group recently released recommendations for companies producing AI-generated images, audio, and other media. I want people to think deeply before deploying this technology, Lebowitz said. They should play around, but we should also think: What purpose are these tools serving in the first place? There is a reason for the concern. While text generators like ChatGPT can make the process of writing emails and marketing documents faster and easier, they also appear to present misinformation as fact. And image generators like Dolly are trained in copying widely available digital art and photography. This has raised copyright concerns from the creators of those works. For companies that are really in the creative industry, if they want to make sure that they have copyright protection for those models, that's still an open question," said Anna Gressel. She is with the law firm Debevois and Plimpton, which advises businesses on how to use AI. Gressel said it is safer to use AI tools as a thought partner, but still use people as the creator of final products. Rowan Curran is with the research and advisory company Forrester. He said AI tools should speed up some office work, much like using word processors and spell checkers. Curran said. It's not like we're talking about having a large language model just generate an entire marketing campaign, and have that launch without expert senior marketers and all kinds of other controls. 
The growing interest in AI tools among the public has fueled growing competition among technology companies Microsoft, Amazon, and Google. Microsoft announced earlier this year it was investing billions more dollars into its partnership with OpenAI. Google is adding Bard Chatbot to its search engine, and Amazon started working with Hugging Face to develop Bloom, a competitor to ChatGPT. Last week we looked at two kinds of poems: the syncane and the diamante or diamond poem. We explored parts of speech, nouns, verbs. Adjectives and adverbs with poems. Many of you wrote to us and shared your poems. In today's everyday grammar, we will look at the syncane and the haiku, but we will place our attention on the use of syllables to create the poems. A syllable is a natural division of a word. For example, the word flower has two syllables, flau and er. The number of syllables in the word depends on the number of vowel sounds. In the word flower, there are two vowel sounds. Although there are about twenty vowels in English. All the sounds can be written with the letters a, e, i, o, u, and sometimes y. One syllable can be written with more than one vowel letter, like in the word boot. Although there are two vowel letters, o and o, there is only one vowel sound, u. When two separate vowel sounds are next to each other in the same syllable, it is called a diphthong. One way to identify vowel sounds is to clap your hands together when you hear the vowel sounds. Take the word winter. We clap our hands together twice. Winter. If you cannot clap, you can tap your foot, or tap a desk, or even count on your fingers. Haiku are short poems that are based on syllables and do not rhyme. They are a Japanese art form, but writers in many countries have copied them. In English, they are expressed in three lines. And the poem has seventeen syllables throughout the three lines. They are centered on nature, and two opposing ideas in a single moment in time. In English, haiku can deal with nature, or they can be about anything, as long as the traditional structure is maintained. Let's look at the English form of the syllable structure for a haiku. Line one, five syllables. Line two, seven syllables. Line three, five syllables. Let's look at an example. Sleeping guinea pigs, eyes wide open, no true trust, until food arrives. In the poem above, I wrote about my guinea pigs. We can see the syllable structure below. Sleeping guinea pigs, five syllables. Eyes wide open, no true trust, seven syllables. Until food arrives, five syllables. Here is another example about winter. Still snowing in March. When will spring be on its way? No sunshine, so sad. Hopefully, spring will be here soon. Let's move on to another kind of poem 
that we learned about before, the syncane. Just like the syncane from last week, the form with syllables has five lines. Each line contains an even number of syllables. Line one contains two syllables. Line two has four syllables. Line three has six syllables. Line four has eight syllables. Line five contains just two syllables, like the first line. Here is an example. Hot days arrive soon now. Sun rises earlier. Sun sets later in the evening. Warm nights. Now let's look at the syllable structure line by line. Hot days, two syllables. Arrive soon now, four syllables. Sun rises earlier, six syllables. Sun sets later in the evening, eight syllables. Warm nights, two syllables. If you understand syllables well, you can include a rhyme or two within the syncane poem. Now you have the structure for two kinds of poems, created by using syllables: haiku and a syncane. Haiku have three lines. All the lines add up to seventeen syllables, divided up into five seven five. A syncane has five lines and a total of twenty two syllables. Each line has an even number of syllables, increasing by two until the last line. Now start brainstorming ideas for your own poem. Write about what you know. Get outside and take a walk. Let nature or your surroundings inspire you. Once you have an idea, you can jump right in. With counting syllables, or you can write your idea in a paragraph form or a list, and then fit it to the structure of either a syncane or a haiku. Send your poems to learningenglish at voanews dot com, or share your poems in the comments below. We love reading what you send. We will select a few to give feedback on next week. You just heard Faith Perlo and Dan Novak present this week's Everyday Grammar Report. Faith joins me now to talk more about the lesson. Hi, Faith. Welcome back. Thanks, Ashley. This week was the follow-up to last week's poetry report, but instead of using parts of speech. To help us write poetry, you talked about using syllables to make poems. Yes, we can use syllables to make poems like haiku and syncanes. Haiku are really simple, only seventeen syllables within three lines. You can remember the numbers five seven five, five syllables in the first line, seven syllables in the second. And five again in the third. Do you want to try to make a haiku, Ashley? Sure. Why don't you start? Okay. Let's write a more traditional one about nature. Magnolia trees, bright pink flowers bloom in spring. Smell of summer soon. I think that was the correct number of syllables. Now you try one, Ashley. Okay, well, here is one inspired by the unusually warm weather we had here in Maryland last month. Yellow daffodils are popping up from the ground, yet snow may come soon. Awesome job! You're a poet, and you didn't even know it. I don't know about that, but thanks, and thanks for coming on the show today. Hopefully, our audience enjoyed our haiku. See you next week, Ashley. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, 
American History in VOA Special English. Woodrow Wilson's first year as president showed the American people that they had elected a strong and effective leader. Wilson took office in 1913. He moved quickly to fulfill his campaign promises. He won congressional approval for lower import taxes, a new tax on earnings, and restrictions on the power of big companies. These were some of the most important economic reforms the nation had seen in many years. Larry West and Morris Joyce continue the story of Wilson's administration. Most of Woodrow Wilson's political victories were on national issues. He had little experience with international issues, but foreign events soon began to demand more and more of his time. With all of his successes at home, it is a surprising fact of history that his presidency is remembered best. For its foreign policy, the story of Woodrow Wilson's foreign policy is full of high ideas and political bravery, but it also is a story of fierce struggle and lost hopes. It is a story that begins across America's southern border, in Mexico. At that time. Mexico had been ruled for many years by Porfirio Diaz. As Diaz grew older, his power began to weaken. In 1911, a revolt broke out. It was led by Francisco Madero, the leader of a land reform movement. Diaz understood he could not win. He resigned, and fled the country. Madero declared himself president. However, powerful groups in Mexico opposed him. In a short time, one of his own generals, Victoriano Huerta, arrested him. Madero was murdered soon after Huerta seized power. President Wilson refused to recognize Huerta's government. He believed other forces would rise up against him. Wilson was right. Another revolt began, led by General Venustiano Carranza. Wilson offered aid to Carranza. Carranza rejected the offer. He was afraid of American interference in Mexico. He told Wilson. That Mexican troops would do all the fighting. He only wanted guns and ammunition. American forces did, however, get involved in the conflict. President Wilson learned that a ship from Germany was bringing supplies to the Huerta government. The ship would land at the Mexican port of Veracruz. Wilson ordered the United States Navy to seize and occupy the port. The move started a storm of criticism in the United States and throughout Latin America. Many people denounced President Wilson. They called him an imperialist and a fool. They asked, "What right did the United States have to interfere in Mexico?" Wilson finally stopped American military action in Mexico. He tried to settle the dispute at an international conference at Niagara Falls, Canada. The effort failed. The conference did not produce a settlement. While the diplomats were talking, Carranza's revolutionary forces were fighting. They moved on Mexico City. The capital. President Huerta fled. Carranza formed a new government. The new government began to split apart almost immediately. Another general, Francisco Pancho Villa, 
tried to seize power. He forced Carranza out of Mexico City. Then he formed his own government. President Wilson recognized Villa and his government. Carranza, however, refused to give up. Day by day his army grew stronger. He forced Villa to retreat. Then President Wilson recognized Carranza's government. Like Carranza, Villa refused to give up. He decided to try to start a war between Mexico and the United States. Pancho Villa wanted the United States to attack Carranza. Then he would step in to lead Mexican forces in battle. That would make him a hero. With this plan in mind, Pancho Villa attacked an American town across the border in Texas. He killed nineteen persons. President Wilson immediately ordered a large American force to find and punish Villa. At first, Carranza welcomed the move. Villa was his enemy. He wanted him captured. Then Carranza began to fear that the American troops might threaten his government. He demanded the withdrawal of all American soldiers from Mexico. Tensions increased between the two countries. Villa's forces attacked another town in Texas. President Wilson considered asking Congress to declare war, but the crisis cooled down before then. American forces were withdrawn, and the people of Mexico elected a new government. They chose Carranza as president. As President Wilson dealt with the situation in Mexico, trouble began to surface in another part of the world. The crisis was in Europe. Tensions were growing between several groups of nations. They were on the edge of what would become World War I. The major powers in Europe had been threatening each other for years, but they had not fought for more than forty years. Most Americans believed there would never be another European war. Such a war would be unbelievably destructive. Millions would die. No nation would win. Europe depended on a balance of power to keep the peace. On one side were the central powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. On the other side were the members of the Triple Entente, Britain, France, and Russia. Each side made every effort to win the support of Europe's smaller nations. A number of nations refused to join either side. The neutrals included Switzerland, Belgium, the Netherlands, and the Scandinavian countries. This political balance did not prevent the major nations from competing with each other for colonies and economic power. They competed all over the world, in China, in the Middle East, in Africa. Everywhere money could be invested. Competition was especially sharp in the Balkans. This was the area of Europe between the Adriatic and Black Seas. Many nations claimed special interests in the Balkans, and several Balkan countries were fighting each other. The whole continent seemed ready to explode.
The spark that set off the explosion came in the city of Sarajevo. The date was June 28, 1914. Sarajevo had been taken over by Austria, and the Archduke of Austria, Ferdinand, had come for a visit. Ferdinand was expected to become the next emperor of Austria. Seven young extremists from the area decided to assassinate the Archduke to protest Austrian control. One of the extremists threw a bomb at the royal family. The bomb missed its target, but another extremist shot at the group. He killed both the Archduke and the Archduke's wife. The assassinations in Sarajevo started a series of events that quickly brought war to all of Europe. Soon the continent was covered with armies, battles, and death. 